trying to start it and it wouldn't start at about 20 minutes till 9 so I really had no time to post anything to Angel or anything so it's all taken care of now so you're probably stuck with me the rest of the semester. Um, I posted a question to uh, an Angel for the discussion board but I didn't seem to have any takers. Um, we're going to discuss that today and the discussion today centers around browser compatibility issues. So first of all, what do we mean when we, when we talk about a browser compatibility issue? Yes. Okay. Hold that thought. The thought was not all browsers are written correctly. Um, but so that might be a cause of browser compatibility issues, but, but what is a browser, what do I mean when I say there's a browser compatibility issue with this page or this site? Any thoughts? Yeah. Okay. And so what's the effect of that? Okay. Right. Um, and that's what I was getting at. When I talk about a browser compatibility issue, uh, I'm talking about where pages don't look the same in different browsers. All right. So what browsers are there? There's, there's several different ones. Um, to name some of the popular ones, um, Internet Explorer is a popular one. It ships with Windows and is part of Windows. Uh, Firefox is a popular one across multiple platforms, uh, Linux, uh, Mac OS, um, and uh, Internet Explorer, or uh, Windows, I mean. Um, Cro Google Chrome is a third popular one. Um, on the Mac, there's Safari. And there's a handful of other ones that have less usage, but are still potentially an issue. I was going to say, uh, yeah, that's a good one. Opera is a good one. Now, this whole issue becomes a little bit more complicated, even, given the fact that we're going to throw mobile devices into the mix, too. And we want a page that works and is effective on mobile devices, too. So there's a lot of different browsers. And browsers are the programs that people use to view web pages. That's the browser's job, is to display web pages. It takes the HTML code that you give it and all the files, all the CSS and images and HTML, and renders the page. That is, it displays the page in the format that you want to. And when I speak of a browser compatibility issue, I uh, am speaking of where pages look different in different browsers. All right. Now, um, to draw the diagram that I always draw, I'm not sure if I've drawn it yet in this class, but I draw it in almost all my classes. We have a client that makes a request over the internet for a web page and the web server sends them back a web page in response. And that web page typically consists of HTML, which we've talked about, CSS, which we've talked about, and JavaScript, which we have not talked about yet. Also, images, etc., are sent back. When I mean about making a request, I mean when you type in a URL on the address bar, that's making a request. Or when I click on a link, or when I go to a bookmark. All these things are making a request to the web server. All right? The client is the system that is making the request and is displaying the result. So when I go and connect to the server and it sends it back, those files live on my machine. And my web browser is the file responsible for displaying it. Now this brings up an important fact, is that you as a web developer have virtually no control over how your clients, how your users are connecting and viewing your page. All right? You have, you, you know, you, you have to plan for any possibility. And there are so many ways that you can connect to a web page. So many that you may, may not even have thought of. Um, you can use a Nintendo Wii to connect to 
a, a web page. You can use a Nintendo DS. You can use a PSP. You can use your phone. You can use a desktop machine, a laptop. All different kinds of laptops, all right? Um, uh, and all of these can be running browsers. First cause of browser compatibility issues. Okay. There we go. First cause of browser compatibility issues is bad code. All right. We talked about the rules of HTML and the rules of CSS, we've also talked about. And if you follow the rules, the browser ought to display the page correctly. More about that in a minute here, because that's unfortunately not always the truth either. All right? But if you break the rules of HTML, the browser essentially guesses what you meant, all right, in a nutshell. So if you forgot an ending tag, the browser guesses what you probably meant, and it takes a shot at displaying the page. It might guess correctly or it might guess incorrectly you know if I sent someone to the store for me and I gave them vague instructions about what to buy they may guess correctly and understand my vague instructions or incorrect instructions or they may guess wrong and get the wrong thing same idea with the browser if you give bad instructions to it the browsers gonna guess it might guess right or it might guess wrong all right so the first step in making sure that we have browser compatibility issues is verifying our code is good. And we'll talk about that in a minute here. But the sad truth is, even though we have correct code, we still may have browser compatibility issues. Why is that? Well. The browser why do I want to say this? The browser renders page wrong. And again, when I talk about browser, keep in mind I'm talking about as specific as a specific browser on a specific platform, a specific version of it. So I can't just make the statement to say this works on Firefox, right? It may work on, you'd have to analyze whether it works on different versions of Firefox on different platforms because each version on each different platform is different code, all right? And as such, someone had to write it and someone could have gotten it wrong, all right? Now, there's two reasons why a browser could render page incorrectly. So maybe your code is right, maybe your code is perfect code, but the browser still doesn't get it right. Why is that? There's a couple of 
possibilities with that. Number one is that the specifications are evolving at the same time as people are working on the browser. All right. In other words, the W3C, which is the organization for creating web pages, doesn't just come out one day and say, here's the rules for HTML5. It's a long and involved process, and they change things, and they add things and throughout the whole process. Well, the browser makers of the world, the Microsoft, the Mozilla folks, the Opera folks, aren't just going to sit and wait around. They're going to try to incorporate those new features into their browsers as quick as they can. But it's a case of a moving finish line. You know, as they are working on browsers, um, the, the W3C is coming up with different rules and changing the rules and so on and so forth. So as a result, you sort of have a moving finish line. So a browser, because organizations want to be continually updating their browser for bug fixes and for uh, other issues, they're continually releasing things even though it may not implement all the features of a particular language. All right. If we were to Google HTML5 compatibility, we could get a sense of what browsers support which parts of HTML5. HTML5 being the newest specification and the one that's evolving is probably the most meaningful one to look at. There's a number of good sites here, and this is one of them. And we can look at some of the new features of HTML5. One of them is a canvas. And what this is showing is that canvas, the canvas tag, is not supported in Internet Explorer 8.0. But it, it does have some support in some of these other versions of the browser. So if I'm running Internet Explorer 9.0, 10.0, or 11, it should be supported. If I'm running Firefox version 22, 23, 25, and so on, it shows what's supported or not. You can pick... Uh, another one. And again, the details of these aren't particularly important, but media queries for CSS. Here is a new way of, Im of, of uh, inputting dates in. All right. If you notice that really very few things support it. That kind of gives a tip off that maybe that's something you don't want to use quite yet if all those browsers don't support it. All right. What you can do is you can try something out as long as there is what's called graceful degradation. That is, if the browser doesn't support it, it doesn't cause problems. There's sort of a fallback here. Um, so when you're thinking of implementing a new feature of HTML5 or whatever, you can look to see what the browser's support of it is, and you can plan to say, well, if the browser doesn't support it, can, you know, will it cause a big problem on my page or not? For example, with the canvas uh, uh, tag. The canvas tag is for animation. Now, you might have an animation on your page, and that won't work under Internet Explorer 8.0 and older. The question is, is what happens when someone does view it with that? Maybe they get the rest of your page, they just don't see the animation. That might be okay, depending on the nature of the animation and what, what the animation was for. All right, so again, that's calling degrading gracefully. In other words, you go to an earlier version of the browser and it doesn't cause any problems. So, we can't be too hard on the browser makers of the world because they're up against a tough battle, right? They are 
writing against a moving finish line and they're, they, they need to get browser releases out before the specification is finalized and so they're doing the best that they can but they can always implement stuff and they certainly can't be blamed for stuff that happened after a release was out. You know, IE8, I don't remember at what point that came out, but maybe some of these HTML5 tags weren't even in existence yet. So you can hardly blame uh, the browser makers for not implementing them. Yes? Am I correct about HTML5 isn't even formally adopted? Yeah, right, right. It's a, it's a draft specification. Um, again, um, the way these specifications work is they go through phases where they get revised and rewritten and all that. Um, it's currently a draft, which means that it's in process and it's subject to change. Now, you know, um, that doesn't mean that they're going to come across and say, well, we're going to get rid of everything we said so far and put these, this new stuff in. Hopefully, at this point, it's just sort of tweaking and finalizing and things like that. But still, Again, that points out the fact that this is a moving target for browser makers. All right. The last reason that a browser renders a page wrong, number one, again, as I mentioned before, is they're fighting, they're racing against a moving target. And number two, browser makers are human too. In other words, they try to implement a feature, but they just don't get it right. All right? Why? Well, because they're human. Just about any software that you can think of has some bug where it doesn't act just the way it's supposed to. So sometimes browser makers get it wrong. All right? Um, now here's the unfortunate aspect of web, de uh, of web development. There's few reasons here why there can be browser compatibility issues. Guess whose problem it is to correct them now? This, yeah, the developer. Does anyone have a mirror? You know, pull out a mirror and look at it. That's whose problem it is to correct it. So regardless of that, you have to play, you know, you have to play with the cards you've been dealt. In other words, if IE 9 doesn't support a particular feature, or there's a bug in IE9, or there's a bug in Firefox or Chrome, you know, it's your web page. You have to make it work. So, and, and that is probably the single most frustrating aspect of web development. You do everything by the book, you get everything right, and it still doesn't work the way it's supposed to. All right. Um, what can I say? You know, the, your only other option would be to, you know, go and talk the browser makers to, into fixing that in earlier releases and then go to everyone in the world and install the new version of the browser. Well, that's not going to happen, right? It's impractical any other solution. You need to fix it and you need to address it, all right? And there's any number of different workarounds that you can do that sort of help you out a bit. And we're going to look at a couple of those workarounds, and we're going to look at a tool that can be used to verify that. Because the starting point of this discussion ought to be that your code works. If your code doesn't work, then you have no right to complain about the browser getting it wrong, right? Because you didn't give it good instructions. Let's take care of that thing first, and then if we still have browser compatibility issues, then we can look at, at ways to fix them. All right, the, the, the first thing that we're going to look at with this relates to a couple things that we can do to help old browsers understand HTML5, okay? There's a lot of new things in HTML5, but one of the big things added to HTML5 were the new structure tags. We talked about them maybe the first or, or second class or within the first week or two, we talked about them. These are things such as the header tag, the nav tag, the section tag, the article tag, the aside tag, the 
exporter tag. All of these are HTML5 tags. These are all new tags where in previous versions of HTML you just had the div tag, which we still have, by the way. Each of these is simply a more specific version of the div tag. In other words, the div tag was used to indicate a division or section of a page. Now we can indicate a section of a page by using these specialized tags that not only indicate that I have a section of the page, but tell me something about what the section is. So for example, in the past you'd put a div in your code for the footer. Now you use a footer tag. And it's obvious that that is the footer of the page, right? Because it's in a footer tag. Whereas in the past, you'd have a div for the footer, a div for the header, a div for the navigation. It wasn't obvious what all those divs were for. The new tags have made it more specific. Now, the problem is, is browsers that were written previous to the HTML5 specification being implemented, all right, don't know what to do with these, all right? What does a browser do when it doesn't know what to do with a tag? Nothing, all right? Which is good in a way. It sounds, it sounds counterintuitive, but it's actually good. Because if it doesn't do anything, it's still going to go and try to display the rest of the page. It might not display it exactly the way we want to because it doesn't understand that tag, but at least it's not going to blow up and give you an error. For example, if you were writing Visual Basic code, all right, and you did something in the Visual Basic code um, that was incorrect, all right, or that used a newer version than you were running a Visual Basic, all right. Let's say you were running VB6, a real old version of Visual Basic, and you tried to do something that was in VB.net, all right? What would happen to your program? It would just not run. It would not run at all, wouldn't do anything, uh-uh, not going to run, and it would just blow up on you. HTML is a lot more forgiving. It will say, hey, I don't know what this is, so I'm going to ignore it, all right? And that's actually not bad, especially when you consider backwards compatibility. So, there's a couple of things we can put in our code, and we'll look at them. And I encourage you to look at them. Uh, the one is fairly easy to understand. The other is pretty confusing. Um, and these things are meant to address the fact that earlier versions of browsers don't recognize those new structural tags. All right? All those new structural tags are, are block tags. You know, so all of those are block tags. Yet, if a browser doesn't recognize it, it's not going to treat it like a block tag. It's just going to ignore it and won't treat it at all. So, one thing that we can do to help pass browser compatibility is if we can somehow convince the browser that these things are block tags, at least we can make old browsers work with some HTML5. All right? And that's what the two fixes do that we're going to look at. I have two things in the header of this page that fix some browser compatibility issues, specifically with previous versions of browsers and HTML5. One is a link to a style sheet called ff.css. We'll take a look at that in a second. That fixes earlier versions of Firefox. 
and other Mozilla-based browsers. The second thing is this little oops, goofy instruction here that has a snippet of JavaScript. And we'll look at this JavaScript, but I wouldn't expect anyone to understand the JavaScript. Just understand that the way this is written, this little snippet of JavaScript will do its thing if the person is running a version of IE prior to version 9. Version 9 is where IE started catching up with the rest of the browsers as far as implementing HTML5. So, we have these two things that we can put in there. One's a style sheet, one's a little snippet of Java code. And really, what those do is those convince the browser that these tags which they don't know anything about, are actually block tags. So display them as block tags, everything will be okay. All right, let's look at these two things. Let's first look at the Firefox.css. Pretty simple. All we're telling it is header tags, nav tags, section tags, article tags, aside tags, footer tags. Treat those like block tags. That's what the display colon block means. So the list of those tags separated by a comma means for each one of those tags. Treat them as though they're block tags. All right? So now earlier versions of Firefox knows that, hey, a nav tag is a block tag. All right? So at least we'll get that part right. Neither of these two fixes like make a browser completely HTML5 compatible, but at, the, at least they take care of this, which is, which is a pretty big problem all right, with browsers not understanding those tags. So you should include this Firefox.css file in every web page that you make, you know, for the time being anyhow, until all these ancient browsers are history. One thing about CSS is you can actually have multiple CSS files on a page. So you might say, well, if I put this in here, will I not be able to use my own CSS file? No, you'll be able to use your own CSS file, and it will simply add on to the CSS file. I would put this first, just in case my CSS file uh, overruled any of this. All right? Because the way it works is if, if there would be two rules that were in conflict, the second one would apply. And I would assume that if I wanted one of these not act like a block tag and I put that in the CSS, that that would be the rule that I would want to apply. So I would assume my rules, I would want to override this stuff. So I would put m this before my rules. Now, Firefox and, and, and the Mozilla-based browsers are neat because even if they don't understand a tag, you can still put a style to it. And that's effectively what we're doing here. Earlier versions of Firefox don't know what a nav tag is, but we can still style it and tell it, treat it like a block tag. And it will behave like, like we would expect it to. We're not so lucky with Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer, if it doesn't know about a tag, you can't apply a style to it. All right, different browsers written by different people at different times. All right, so we have this little snippet of code. And we can find this on the web. And we can read through this. It's called a 
the HTML5 shiv. Here's a description of it. It's licensed under a, a free open source license, so you're welcome to use it. It's not as though, you know, I am stealing code that I'm not meant to have. Effectively, this does the same thing that that Firefox CSS file does. That is, it gets Internet Explorer to recognize that the new HTML5 tags are actually valid and are actually block tags. All right? That is JavaScript. So, again, Firefox, our job is easy. We can style it even if the browser doesn't know what it is. The browser says, hey, I don't know what a nav tag is, but I'll let you style it. So we use that fix. For Internet Explorer, we can't style something it doesn't know about. So effectively, this snippet of JavaScript lets IE know, hey, there's such a thing as a nav tag, there's, and we want to treat it like it's block. All right? So the bottom line from all this is that these lines of code really should be in every one of your pages from now on, and you should include those other two files that I have. This is discussed in the book, and I don't remember the precise page number, page 200 and something. I know that's pretty vague, but at least I narrowed it down to a range of 100 pages, all right? But somewhere in, I think in the 260s, um, this is discussed. So you can see this in the book and, and see an explanation. The good news is, even if you don't understand exactly how this works, understand what the net effect is. And the net effect is that it makes HTML5 understandable to some degree by older browsers. Ah, good point. No, you did not. This is something... Actually, I copied this example from one of my other classes, and I decided to leave that in. All right. That is something that helps with displays on mobile devices. That allows mobile devices to see the screen better than they otherwise would. So, um, yeah, that, that's the purpose of that. Uh, lang, e lang equals English is simply another attribute that you can put on the HTML tag. Um, I believe if you don't specify it, the assumption is that it's English. So, um, but you can specify that, and that is useful in some cases. Some uh, search engines, for example, allow you to um, search by language, you know, and, and, and so on. So, not absolutely required, but yeah, it is a, an additional attribute. All right, so what we have left as far as today goes is how do we verify code is good, all right? Well, looking at the code isn't the answer, right? Looking at the code is, isn't the answer for a couple reasons. Right? First of all, if I made a mistake in writing the code, it's likely that I'm not going to be able to see it by staring at it. All right? We are, after all, human. And as such, especially as you're working on things and your eyes get tired and you get tired, you're liable to miss something um, small that, that could potentially cause an issue. The other issue is you might not be aware of all the rules, all right? 
some of the rules that exist in HTML we've not really formally defined. We've implemented them correctly, but we haven't formally defined them. For example, the nav section belongs in the body, not in the head. So if I do this, and I put the body here, that's actually a mistake. That's actually wrong. Now, I haven't said that in class. I mean, all my examples, the nav section has been in the, in the body and not the head. All right? But I haven't defined that and said that that's an absolute rule. All right? So there's some things that you may not have realized are rules or may not have realized are important. And the tool that we're going to use, however, does know all the rules and will let us know if we're missing something that's important. All right, and that tool is called the validator. Now, there's two validators that we're interested in. One validates our markup, which is our HTML code, and the other validates our CSS code. So, I can go to w3c.org and along the side here there is the validators and I can click on the validators for HTML and I can either validate by putting in the address of the of it if it's if it's something that's on the uh, already up on the web I can validate by uploading a file or what I typically do validate by direct input which simply means I copy and paste my code and paste it in there. Then I can run validate. And when I run validate, ooh, I have an error. And it's telling me that language subtag en is not a valid language subtag. And if we scroll through the list of valid subtags, I pass that. Maybe it's lying to me. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll get rid of that. I'm not sure why it's giving me an error. 
I, it might want me to do this. doesn't like that either. All right. We'll get rid of this all together. All right, it passed now. And it passed because I got the little green bar. And it says that there are three warnings. We'll look at the warnings, but we'll not worry too much about them probably. Um, warning is, first of all, first of all is warning us that this is an experimental feature. All right, so it's warning us that, that this validator isn't necessarily foolproof. It's telling me there's no character encoding. Um, you can specify what character set your page is using. You know, some other languages use a different set of characters than the regular uh, alphabet that's defined in the US, so you can define that. If you don't do it, it assumes the, the, the US alphabet. And finally, um, it can't check this Um, it can't check this in this mode, so it gives me a warning that tells me that. In a nutshell, these warnings don't really mean that there's anything wrong, so I can ignore those. Now, one thing to remember about this is this is a computer program that's checking your code. That means that it's not going to come back necessarily with a very precise error message. Let's make an error that we understand that's an error. And let's see what message it gives us. Let's say I forget to close this section. All right. If I paste this in here, it actually came up with two errors. And that's an important lesson, too, that one mistake in your web page can actually generate a couple different errors. Keep in mind when it points out an error that it's not necessarily going to show you the precise place where the error is, but it's just going to give you a general idea. So, the first error is a little cryptic. End tag for body seen, but there were unclosed elements. Effectively, what that is saying is, I've hit the end of the body tag, yet there's something inside the body that isn't closed. Well, that's correct, right? The section isn't closed. So it doesn't know necessarily, it doesn't tell you necessarily where the problem is, but it knows, hey, by this point, I should have had an end section tag. All right? And then the other thing is, as well, it does tell me on this line that, hey, I have a start section tag and no end section tag. The first time that people run a validator on their code, a lot of times they panic, all right? And they panic because, number one, remember that one error can trigger a bunch of error messages, all right? And secondly, the error messages are a little cryptic. That is, they're hard to understand, and it takes a little practice to sort of understand what it's doing. Let me make another one. Let me do that error that I talked about before, where I don't have the nav in the body section. I got one air. All 
a body star tag seen, but an element of the same type was already open. Kind of a confusing message. We know that there's something wrong with the body tag, and if we look at it, we can decide, okay, maybe it's telling us the body tag's in the wrong place. Another thing that students often do is they'll make LI elements and not have a list tag associated with them. And this gives us five errors. Effectively, what it's telling us is that li tag can't be in the nav tag by itself. Well, why can't it be in a nav tag? Well, it needs to be in a ul tag within the nav section. So it gave me that five times. I, you know, it is likely that you are going to run into some errors that are just very cryptic that you're going to have a hard time and you should bring those to my attention when you run into them. Um, there is also a validator for um, CSS and we'll talk more about that um, next time All right, as we finish up this discussion of browser compatibility issues. Think of this as being like the spell check for your page, all right? It's not telling you that the web page is good. It's telling you you follow the rules of grammar for HTML. Your web page could still be very poorly designed or, um, you, know, have a, you know, have browser compatibility issues uh, because of simple issue with the browser not implementing the specification correctly. But this is a good first point. You know, so before you start looking uh, at that, um, before you start blaming the browser, make sure your code is right, and then go in and look to see what you can do to accommodate it. We'll, we'll wrap this up on Monday and start talking about page design and site design and eventually about your project. All right, we'll see you over in lab.